Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Patrick Donnelly. I am the CFFS uh, team lead at Red Hat. Uh, my colleague, Jeff Layton, couldn't make it to KubeCon this year, so uh, he won't be joining me to give this talk, so he'll just have me. Uh, today, I want to be talking about um, a new technology we've been working on to have uh, NFS servers um, deployed with uh, the Rook um, uh, storage operator uh, with Kubernetes and have these NFS servers uh, export the Ceph file system. So uh, to begin, uh, um, since many of you may not be aware of CephFS, uh, CephFS is a POSIX distributed file system uh, originally developed around 2005 by Sagewell um, to serve as a file system for HPC clusters in, um, for the national labs. Um, CephFS is uh, um, is interesting because it, uh, it uses uh, the clients and the MDSs cooperatively um, maintain a distributed cache of the, of the inodes and and the directories. Um, that is uh, sort of a difference between many other distributed file systems where clients talk directly to servers and the servers manage all the state. Uh, this was a decision made early on to allow the clients to, to have uh, uh, direct access to the, da to the data without needing to go through any um, type of gateway. Um, CephFS uh, is, provides um, full uh, failover uh, management by the use of, for example, standby metadata servers. It also provides for horizontal scale out by having multiple active metadata servers serve in a cluster. Um, the metadata servers do not maintain any state. They're um, very easy to containerize. They uh, store all their state in uh, Rados, Rados being a distributed object data storage. Data store, which is the main underlying component of Ceph, uh, on top of that, the metadata servers um, represent the, the metadata hierarchy and they present that to the clients for access. Clients directly talk to the, the object store when they're writing, reading or writing to the, the file objects. In order to maintain consistency, the MDS hands out capabilities, which are similar to leases uh, from the academic concept. Uh, they hand these out to clients, which allow them to delegate uh, metadata authority to clients. In particular, they can allow clients to write to data um, or also um, buffer writes of, of data or cache reads and do this safely in such a way that it doesn't conflict or is inconsistent with other clients. Um, so moving on, uh, the origins of this project actually began with uh, OpenStack. There's two primary uh, services within OpenStack that use Ceph. Uh, there's Manila, which is a uh, file share service for virtual machines within OpenStack. And then also Cinder, which is a block device provisioner for VMs used primarily to create root uh, disks for, for a virtual machine to boot from. And uh, we've uh, gone a great have uh, done a lot of integration with Ceph in, in this way, and Ceph has become one of the more popular um, storage technologies to use within OpenStack. Uh, community survey done in the past, uh, in a few years ago, uh, found that CephFS was the primary um, uh, storage provider for, for use within uh, Manila. Uh, and the reasons for this, I think, are fairly straightforward. Uh, Ceph is a open source uh, dis, uh, storage solution and is easy to um, uh, incorporate in, into your OpenStack clusters and then also um, uh, it's free. So uh, if I'm talking about OpenStack, then why, what, why not, um, why am I here? Uh, why are we talking about, why should I be talking about Kubernetes? So. Um, it turns out that there's a big push uh, right now, uh, as we all know, that uh, to manage um, 
distributed services within the context of a container orchestrator, in this case Kubernetes. Uh, and there's a lot of attractive reasons for doing this. Um, containers are uh, lightweight and um, easy to deploy in response to changing application needs. Importantly, uh, especially for this project, it allows for extensible service infrastructure so I can deploy services in response to the changing needs of the application. Uh, containers are also um, parallel enough to be, uh, or, or lightweight enough to allow for easy parallelism. I can deploy a lot of containers in response to sudden, uh, to those changing needs of the, of the application. Um, it's a much easier uh, to do failover with, with uh, in a container orchestrating environment. Um, the, uh, instead of having a dedicated machine that is there to take over when a service fails, I can just spin up a new container anywhere in my infrastructure uh, to take over that role. And finally, Kubernetes also allows us to do fast IP failover management, which will become important later on. Uh, in this discussion. Okay, so um, how we're using Kubernetes within Ceph is through the Rook storage operator. Uh, within Ceph, there's now a big push to um, deploy most Ceph clusters in the future using Kubernetes and Rook. Um, Rook is uh, one of the, the main storage operators for, for, handle, uh, for handling storage within the context of Kubernetes. And Ceph is one of the primary storage systems that uh, it, it uh, supports. Um, and the way uh, Kubernetes, or the way Rook works within this context is I can define now a Ceph cluster that I want to deploy within Kubernetes. And it's as simple as uh, feeding it some YAML files into kubectl and the Rook or, uh, agents that are running on all the, the nodes will uh, figure out where it can host uh, object storage devices with, uh, for Ceph, uh, attaching an object storage device to available um, disk drives or SSDs on all of your nodes in your Kubernetes cluster, and then um, deploying the Ceph daemons as needed in order to get your cluster ready. The great uh, hallmark success of this is that it allows you to deploy a Ceph cluster without knowing anything about Ceph, which has historically been a very difficult thing to do. Uh, Ceph being a distributed system had a lot of knobs to turn and a lot of, um, of upkeep to, to do on all of your different um, computers that are serving Ceph. And now with uh, these uh, storage operators, this is becoming easier than ever to host a uh, Ceph cluster without knowing anything about distributed storage. So uh, coming back to the subject of this talk, why do we want a uh, NFS gateway in front of Ceph? Uh, so you may remember uh, when I was talking, uh, talking about earlier, the primary uh, use case for CephFS was for an HPC environment where we're running a lot of uh, high performance computing jobs that uh, need access to fast uh, file systems, especially for example for scratch space. And that was its target use case. And because of that, it was operating in a mostly trusted environment, and the, the application could be trusted to, to access the file system in a, in a, a safe manner. Um, in, a, in today's deployments in like OpenStack or Kubernetes, and how you may want to um, serve your infrastructure to various tenants, that may not be an assumption you can safely make. Uh, and there's a few reasons for that. Um, it's not necessarily easy to, to restrict which, uh, which types of clients are accessing your file system. You may have, um, for example, if I'm running with an OpenStack and I have uh, virtual machines being brought up by my customers and they're running older kernels, it may not work um, without bugs uh, against my uh, Ceph cluster. And I lack control over what types of clients they're using to talk to Ceph. Um, another issue is uh, security. You may want to uh, firewall off your storage cluster, in fact, you probably do, uh, to prevent clients from having unrestricted access to your, to your storage network. Um, so there may be a firewall. 
Additionally, you may want to introduce some kind of authentication and authorization mechanisms, for example, through Kerberos, which CEPH does not yet support, and uh, force clients to authenticate through those mechanisms. So moving on. Um, so for that reason, it's attractive to put an NFS um, daemon in front of CephFS, NFS being an, a very common um, file access protocol within, uh, within the industry, and put that in front of um, Ceph in order to uh, serve as a gateway between the clients and uh, the Ceph cluster. NFS Ganesha is uh, an open source NFS server and it runs completely in user space without any dependencies on the kernel. Uh, it's open source software licensed under the LGPL. Uh, what makes Ganesha attractive is that it provides a plug-in interface for uh, multiple different kinds of exports and then also provides support for uh, exporting different types of file systems. The most uh, obvious and uh, usual case would be a local file system having the NFS uh, or Ganesha export the, the, something in the local file system, but within our case we want to actually export the CFFS file system. Um, to do this, uh, Ganesha has these backends called the, the file system abstraction layer, and the abstraction layer for Ceph uses libcephfs to actually talk to the Ceph cluster, so any incoming NFS request RPC will uh, be translated into a corresponding call to, uh, through libcephfs. Uh, correspondingly, uh, Ganesha also uses libratos. Uh, which is a uh, library that direct, gives direct access to the object storage layer to uh, store its various state that it needs to maintain in order to recover from a, a failover uh, when a standby Ganesha takes over. It also uses uh, uh, Rados to now store its configuration files instead of using the uh, uh, Etsy namespace within, for example, uh, its file system. And for these reasons, um, Ganesha is very amenable to uh, containerization. We can store all of our, uh, all, all of the file system state is of course stored in CephFS. Uh, we can store all of the configuration and recovery information within Rados. There's no need for a writable uh, local file system. And Uh, so one of the things we wanted to have was uh, scale out, and that is we wanted to have multiple Ganeshas be able to export the same uh, CephFS file system, which is not as easy as you might uh, think it to be, mostly for reasons of consistency. We want to be able to have a service that's container, container, containerizable uh, so that we could use it in the existing, in the uh, future um, work of, of uh, containerizing Ceph for use in a deployment, uh, container deployment orchestrator like uh, Kubernetes. Additionally, we wanted to support a newer NFS protocol which uh, has several, um, which notably allows for NFS clients to store state so that uh, they can get better performance. And finally, uh, the ability to talk to uh, Ceph and Rados for, for all of this communication. No need for any type of uh, third-party um, clustering software, for example, uh, CT, uh, CLTDB, um, which has normally been used in the past uh, for Ganesha to handle um, failover management. So up to now, uh, Ganesha has uh, been deployed in a passive active uh, fashion. And this has been um, available since Ceph Luminous back in August 2017. Um, you have one NFS server, which all of your NFS clients talk to. 
Um, and you use the uh, third-party tools, Pacemaker, CoroSync, to um, handle the failover between the active NFS Ganesha daemon and the standby NFS daemon. The main drawback of this approach is that it scales poorly and it requires idle resources. Uh, you need a uh, idle NFS Ganesha server available to take over when the active fails. And all of the NFS clients are talking to a single active NFS server for all of their data um, needs, which uh, obviously will not scale very well. So one of our goals was to allow for all of these NFS clients to talk to multiple uh, NFS servers. So um, why this is uh, difficult uh, to put multiple NFS servers uh, in front of the Ceph file system in an active-active fashion is because of the NFS clients now having state. Um, in particular now, uh, uh, in NFS v4, we have the, the clients are now leased, uh, given leases similar to CephFS capabilities. Uh, which allow them to read or write to files or hold locks. And the clients must now contact the NFS server uh, e during uh, a lease period between 45 and 60 seconds. Um, this had a few problems, mainly around uh, failover of clients. And uh, in NFS v4.1, which is the target protocol we're supporting, uh, they now have a sessions layer added on to for the NFS clients when they're talking to the NFS server, which provides uh, exactly once semantics. So you don't, when you're retrying an operation, it doesn't happen multiple times. Um, and now also a reclaim, reclaim complete operation. So when an NFS uh, server um, goes um, uh, goes down and it comes back up. It begins a reclaim process where all the NFS clients can uh, reestablish whatever state they had with the prior NFS server. Uh, that was, if you waited the entire lease period, that means nothing could actually happen with, uh, in terms of I.O. for any client of the NFS server. Uh, so they added a new reclaim complete operation, which allowed uh, the NFS server to lift the, the grace period early. Um, moving on. So uh, after an NFS server restarts or uh, a server takes over for a, for a failed NFS server, uh, it has no ephemeral state because it doesn't store its state um, anywhere locally. And so all the clients have to uh, notify the NFS server exactly what state they had. That includes what files they had open, um, how they had the files open, any kinds of locks they had. And because you don't want uh, one client to say, I, had, um, uh, I, want, I, I want to write to this file, and another client which has not reconnected yet, has write access to that file, and maybe buffering writes, uh, you need to wait a little bit to give all the clients a chance to reconnect to the server. And that's what, that's what this reclaim session period is, is two lease periods. Lease period cor corresponding to how long you wait for a client to say they're still uh, holding on to a lease. Um, so during that grace period, the NFS server can't issue any new state and the clients may reclaim um, the state they had prior to the crash. And in fact, this um, uh, method of recovering all of the state that you had open is very similar to what we do in CephFS. Um, moving on. So logically, this can be organized into a series of epics uh, where the where an epic corresponds to the lifetime of a particular instance of an F NFS daemon, beginning with a grace period where all the NFS clients can reconnect and try to establish whatever state they had. And then you have, after that completes, 
the NFS server transitions into the normal operation, which will be um, generally a very long time. It should be in a normal operation. So failovers are not um, that common. Um, so the observation is that we can use the same uh, logical organization of, of the grace periods and the normal operations and have this apply to a cluster of servers. And why that's a difficult problem is that if we have multiple NFS servers uh, exporting the same backing file system, um, they will, uh, you may have state this issue to one client of one NFS server, and uh, during a failover event, another NFS uh, client of the other NFS server may try to acquire that state. And so now we need to form agreement on what state has been issued and how to reclaim it. And so the way that NFS Ganesha handles that is through the use of coordinating grace periods. It has a central database and a Rados object, uh, which uh, keeps track of what the current grace period epoch is for all of the NFS servers, so that they can form consensus on, on uh, when the grace period should happen. So all the NFS servers together in the cluster will enter grace period together uh, whenever there's a failover event so that none of the NFS servers accidentally issue state that another client that needs to reconnect to a failed NFS server uh, needs to reclaim. So these are some uh, details on how that works that I won't get into due to time, but I'm willing to take questions on it later. So the next challenge we had to address with this work um, is we wanted to layer NFS over a cluster file system. Um, and because both of the protocols for CephFS and also NFS uh, v4.1 are stateful and they use a, a least based mechanism, you need some way to uh, handle the case where an NFS server uh, fails and another one, another server wants to come in to acquire that state, and you need a way to um, uh, make that failover event happen faster in the uh, within CephFS. Namely, CephFS has uh, its own timeouts that it maintains for its clients. Whenever a client fails and comes back, that client has a certain amount of time to reestablish its session with CephFS. Likewise, all those NFS demons, um, all, all the NFS clients have a certain amount of time the, corresponding to the lease periods to, uh, to reconnect to the NFS demon to reestablish their state. And there's some conflicts, or there's some overlap there in time, which can cause a, a very long delay for the NFS clients to reestablish their state and be able to continue the normal operations they want to perform. And, uh, and, uh, how long it takes for the NFS server to reacquire the state it needs with in, in CephFS. So one of the new features in Nautilus was that we allowed a uh, client to reclaim the state of a prior session. Uh, when a CephFS client dies abruptly, the MDS will keep its session around uh, for several minutes allowing that client to come back and say, uh, I'm still here, uh, and I want to reclaim all of these, uh, the, the capabilities that I had, all the file locks that I had. Um, and then with the presumption that these clients are not actually, have not actually failed and come, and come back as a brand new client, there was simply a network partition that uh, separated them from the MDS. And for a while, this was um, fine enough for, uh, for a kernel client, which um, uh, if it were to restart, uh, it wouldn't be trying to uh, get a new session with MDS. It would um, create, uh, or it wouldn't try to reclaim the old session with MDS because all the applications that were running with the kernel client have also been rebooted. So it just gets a fresh state. It's the same thing with uh, CephFuse. Uh, which is another alternative uh, mounting mechanism for CephFS. With NFS Ganesha, we have this new problem where 
uh, the NFS daemon has state that it's issued to the clients, and if the daemon fails and comes back, those it needs to reacquire all that state that it had in the prior session. So now in Nautilus, uh, CephFS supports an, a CephFS client to come back and claim all the state that it had in a prior instance of the client without knowing uh, immediately what all that state was. During the grace period for the NFS server, uh, the clients will come in and say what state they had with the, the, NFS, the prior instance of the NFS daemon, what files I had open. Correspondingly, this, the Ganesha server will talk to CephFS and reestablish the state that it had from the prior session. When all of that is complete, it actually completes uh, the session similar to the reclaim complete operation that the NFS uh, clients send to the NFS server. So our next challenge is uh, the deployment and management of NFS clusters. Um, now we have all of the basic mechanisms in place to build a cluster of NFS servers that are in an active-active uh, configuration. Now what we need next is a trivial uh, or a simple way to deploy those NFS Ganesha servers in an active-active uh, configuration dynamically um, in, uh, corresponding to whatever kind of load we have on the uh, on, on that particular export of the file, CephFS file system that, um, that the NFS clients are, are accessing. And then also we want to scale in another direction where we have an NFS cluster um, for each uh, export in the CephFS file system we have. So keep in mind the CephFS can be a very large file system with billions of inodes and uh, many different users with different use cases uh, and applications. And so we want to be able to have an NFS cluster front each uh, subtree within CephFS corresponding to the application need. And all of those, and then you, you've achieved uh, a few things by doing that. The, you improve performance because now you are isolating certain file system behaviors with a, a group of NFS cluster uh, uh, demons. You're improving the caching of the NFS demons because now you have applications that are all accessing the same NFS servers. And you can also improve security because now I, am, I can isolate the, the, the cluster of NFS demons based off of which application should be using them. And furthermore, uh, isolate which parts of the CephFS file system tree that the NFS demons have access to based off of what applications will be uh, using those NFS clusters. Finally, um, another challenge we need to address is uh, IP migra migration and failover. So when an NFS server inevitably may die for some, for some reason, we need a way to spin up a replacement very quickly and cheaply. And also, we need a way, a mechanism to migrate an IP address from the prior instance of the NFS server to the new instance. And these are historically dis difficult problems but um, not anymore, and the reason for that is, is Kubernetes. Uh, it's fairly simple to uh, spin up new containers in response to failover, and also you can migrate the IP address to the new uh, pod. So this is where Rook and Kubernetes come in. Um, Rook now supports in the version 1.0 release that just came out the ability to specify a Ceph NFS resource type, which will launch the uh, NFS Ganesha uh, servers in response to um, the kubectl command creating those objects. And uh, Rook and now, and now um, Ceph have a, a deep integration with each other between the, the Ceph Nautilus release, which was just uh, released about two months ago, and uh, Rook itself. So now Ceph is also um, Extend, extensible in, with Rook in that it now is able to deploy services in response to um, to the changing application needs, for example, creating a new file system. Um, 
by talking to Rook and saying, I, you know, I need another metadata server, please spin another container up. And this has all been abstracted away very nicely. And um, the we are playing, we will, we are able to use this to have the manager daemon deploy NFS clusters in response to uh, what the uh, uh, user um, specifies via the um, uh, how how they specify the NFS cluster for their for their file system. Furthermore. We can um, scale up the NFS cluster up or down in response to how the uh, application um, needs change and have this all um, centrally managed from the, the manager. In the future, we also want to use this to, uh, as sort of a holy grail type concept within CephFS. We've always thought it would be very nice to be able to deploy more active metadata servers in response to the, neat, the change, uh, changing load of the file system. Uh, we also plan to use that, um, the same um, the same th uh, idea and apply this within CephFS as well to, to scale MDSs. So um, in summary of this work, uh, we've built several mechanisms um, that are available today to, uh, deploy, um, to deploy these NFS clusters in front of Ceph. Uh, now we have this ability to create volumes and subvolumes, volumes corresponding to separate Ceph file systems, which um, multiple Ceph file systems are not yet supported within Ceph. That's something we're planning to do in a future release. The more common thing to do is to have this subvolume concept where you separate or you dedicate an entire directory tree to uh, a volume, which may be uh, exported to a particular um, virtual machine or, or a set of containers for sharing. Uh, and then this allows uh, Manila for OpenStack or the CSI interface for Kubernetes. All of your pods can use the same interface to talk to or to set up, configure volumes, and then also uh, configure the exports of those volumes. The other mechanism we have uh, finished and built is the Rook and Ceph integration. So now Ceph can launch these NFS clusters uh, dynamically and configure these um, uh, NFS clusters to have a, a set of exports and configs corresponding to these subvolumes. And finally, we've updated NFS Ganesha to be cluster aware and uh, have faster and correct recovery with the Ceph file system. And as far as vision for the future, um, again, we have all these mechanisms built. What the next stage of, of our work is to actually make this. Um, uh, much uh, very turnkey in terms of actually configuring the volume and then uh, setting up the NFS Ganesha cluster. So to, uh, in version 14.2.2, the next version of the CephFS Nautilus, uh, sorry, Ceph Nautilus release, um, you'll be able to create these subvolumes through a centralized uh, command. And then in a, uh, a subsequent future release, we're planning to make it very simple to actually deploy an NFS cluster in an active, active fashion in front of Ceph with Rook and Kubernetes, just with a simple command uh, enabling NFS um, and setting uh, various configuration options you might want to have. For example, what kind of um, uh, NFS or network namespace you want to attach the pods to in terms of, say, for example, um, if I have uh, OpenStack um, uh, vir virtual machines that have been set up and I want to attach my uh, NFS Ganesha clusters to the same network namespace that, uh, that, those, uh, that those tenants are in, then I can configure that through this, um, this, this command and then finally turn it on by just setting share NFS to true. Furthermore, we also want to add um, support for NFS version with the NFS version 4 migration of clients. So we want to be able to uh, not just expand the size of the NFS cluster, but then also shrink it. And that involves shifting all the clients of the NFS server that you want to remove and have them move on to uh, one of the remaining um, NFS servers within the cluster. And then finally, um, uh, optimizing the grace periods for subvolumes because right now all the NFS clusters are, are within the same 
topological cluster in terms of grace periods, then that may not be necessary because subvolumes within CephFS may not share any inodes, so there is no shared state between subvolumes. It would be better for the NFS server clusters to be isolated from each other and not uh, enter grace periods together because there would be no conflicting state between them. And then finally, it would also be nice to use this for SMB. So that's all of my time. Um, thank you for your attention and coming to my talk. I'll take any questions. Uh, the I.O. from NFS client and uh, NF server communicate with self, so the I.O., they share the same network? So uh, the NFS clients may be on a different network namespace than the, um, uh, than the storage ones. I, I mean for NFS server? Yeah. So NFS server, uh, so NFS server have two networks? Yes, it would have two networks. Oh, okay, okay, sorry. Which requires um, newer features, as I understand it, in Kubernetes, to be able to enable having multiple network namespaces attached to a pod. This has not historically been possible. Any other questions? Okay, thank you for your time.